What's up guys, it's Marius from Audio Judgment and today we're going to mess up some speaker boxes. We're going to move around the port of a bass reflex box on different panels and see if that makes a difference. I'm sure some of you guys heard that you should never place your port precisely behind your speaker because that will result in absolute failure. Is that true? We're going to find out. So here's the plan. We have two enclosures to play with. A subwoofer, this uses some Dayton Audio 8-inch driver and the port is 70mm in diameter. It doesn't matter how it's tuned because we are going to compare the results between them and we are not interested in the, in the performance. And because I suspect that the results from the subwoofer won't be that spectacular, I'm going to do some tests on a floor standing speaker. Now this is the test box from the cheap floor standing speaker project from a while back. I basically covered up the tweeter hole and now it's good to go. If you build a floor standing speaker, odds are excellent that you will encounter standing waves. Since the box is very tall and the bass driver plays mid-range frequencies as well, some frequencies will ring like crazy. There is absolutely no damping material inside the box. And I'm genuinely curious if uh, moving the port around will reduce that uh, standing wave or not. Next up, I want to describe how I plan to move the port around. Basically, I'm going to make a cutout on some other panel of the box and instead of throwing away the resulting disc, I'm going to keep it so I can plug the hole of the initial port location. I'm going to stick uh, that disc to a larger scrap piece from around the workshop use abundant wood glue and make a perfect seal. If I just use a panel to cover up the hole, the box will be slightly larger and this plug method will leave no room for discussion that the box uh, volume changes. For measuring, I'm going to use the near field method. We're measuring uh, woofers and subwoofers and it's the best method to get an anechoic response uh, inside the house. While these measurements seem straightforward, as you just place the mic as close as possible to your speaker or port, you do need to know how to scale the responses before you can add them together, and also how to transform from half space response to whatever shape your box has. If you're curious on how to do these measurements, you can check out my course. And now that we got uh, all of that out of the way, let's get to the measurements. Let's start with the subwoofer. Here are the places where the port will go. The initial position is in the front. Then I move the port on the back panel, precisely behind the speaker. Surely somebody is going to get upset by this port location choice. Then I place the port uh, still on the back panel, but slightly offset compared to the speaker location. So a bit to the right on whatever space I still had available on that panel. Finally, the port was placed on the side panel, the one opposed to the speaker location, otherwise it would hit the speaker. So let's check out uh, the responses. These are the summed responses from the port plus speaker. And basically this is an anechoic response accurate to around, I don't know, probably 500 hertz. So anything above 500 hertz, not cool. However, we're interested in the lower part only, so I'm going to uh, click this 10 to 200 hertz button uh, because this is the part we're interested in. Now let's compare the front position with the port uh, placed uh, precisely behind the speaker. So these are the two responses. Well, what do you know? There is no difference. I mean, you can see a difference, but uh, that is less than 1 dB, uh, which is within the margin of error of the measurement. I don't know what people think. Maybe they imagine that the sound will escape through the port or something. That's not how fluid dynamics work. Uh, if your port is getting too close to the speaker magnet, then yes, try a different location the port needs uh, some clearance. The rule of thumb is, uh, for example, if you have a four inch diameter port, you need at least four inches of clearance from the end of the port to the opposite panel. 
If you place it behind the speaker, make sure you have at least 4 inches from the magnet of the speaker. If that checks out, then you're good to go. Now, uh, let's take the rest of the responses and uh, compare them. Uh, and there is one that sticks out like a sore thumb. What happened here and why there is such a big difference between this one and the rest? This port placement is on the back panel, a bit on the side compared to the speaker location. Does this matter that much? While the port placement may affect the performance of your speaker, most of the time the difference is just slight. In this case, the difference is too large and it has to be some other explanation. And since I'm the guy making this video, I have to explain this abnormality. Have you ever heard of box losses? Depending on how you construct the box, it will have some losses, more or less. Let me show you in WinISD. So if we input the data of uh, our project, we get uh, a response that uh, resembles uh, something like this. And uh, if you click the advanced button, you will see three values. QL, which is the leakage of the box, QA, which refers to the losses induced by absorbent material uh, inside the box, and QP, which are the losses caused by the port. In a well-designed box, QP is negligible, and QA is not existent because there is no damping material inside the box. The higher the number, the lower the losses. Here, 100 means there are no losses. However, when it comes to QL, leakage, you will have some losses, more or less. To give you a perspective regarding the scale, 7 is considered normal losses. 15 is very little losses, so a great box. And QL of 3 is a leaky box, and you have to fix it or make a new one. Since I absolutely desecrated this box, made numerous holes, sealed them back up, take the speaker out, put it back in, and so on. It's no surprise that maybe the box is not in the original shape anymore. I did my best to keep the box as airtight as possible, but leakage is not a parameter that can be predicted. It can be calculated, but only after the box is finished. So let me show you what happens when you have a leaky box. So QL goes down. Uh, this is QL of 7. And if I drag this, I can reduce uh, QL, which means leakage. So, as you can see, the response goes down as leakage increases. As a result, I find this response uh, the result of having some box leakage that I wasn't aware of. As I hope that my explanation is satisfactory, I muster the courage to move on to the floor standing speaker. While I breeze through the subwoofer, I want to take more time with the floor standing speaker, see if we can draw some conclusion. So first of all, let's look at the overall responses. Basically, they look pretty much similar in terms of efficiency or how low it goes. The initial position of the port, so this red line, looks a bit better compared to the rest of, uh, to the, rest of the port locations. You can see over here it has better low-end response. However, if we look upwards in the frequency spectrum, we see this squiggly thingy in the 100-200 Hz region. That is the standing wave doing all sorts of nasty stuff. If we look at the four responses, we can see that the initial response has the worst of it. So let me tick this off. We can see that the other three are better looking in terms of, in terms of the standing wave. So while the low end response is better, the standing wave is also worse. In this case, which response is better? In my opinion, there is not much to debate. While the low-end response is better, you need more damping material inside the box to tame that standing wave, which is much more potent. More damping material, less output from the base reflex port. Remember the box losses we talked earlier. It's losses induced by absorbent material. Basically, you win some, you lose some, and you're back in the same spot. Let's move on to the individual measurements. So the near field measurement of the speaker and port separately for each port location. For these measurements, we can also check the distortion. So first of all, let's compare the port responses. 
So I'm going to untick the speaker responses. And we are left with just the ports. So what conclusion can we draw from these responses? We can see that in some cases, this is the standing wave, we can see the output of the standing wave is larger than the port output it, uh, itself. So uh, we can imagine that this is not a scenario we want to be we want to be in. So having a port which is louder than the standing wave is beneficial because uh, it might cover up that uh, standing wave. So this one, the orange line, which is the port on the front baffle but uh, way below, is arguably the worst response. So I'm going to tick that off. If we compare the port on the back with the port on the side, we can see that they are basically the same. Arguably, the port on the back is larger in output, so uh, maybe better than this one. So here uh, we are left with just two responses and let's compare um, how much decibel difference there is uh, between the standing wave and the port output so we can decide which one is the best. So in this case we have 113.7 and 117. So roughly 3.5 3 decibels difference. And in this case we have 110 and 116. So 6 decibels difference. In this case the port is uh, uh, much louder compared to the standing wave. So 6 decibels difference compared to 3. So uh, the port uh, placed on the back is uh, the winner. And now let's compare the speaker responses. So I'm going to untick the ports and tick uh, the speakers. Here uh, we can also see the resonant frequency of the box. So if I make this a larger, this dip corresponds to the tuning frequency of the box and we can see we have two of them at around 36. One is at 38, one is at 39. I don't think this is very important. This will vary a bit if you have one, two hertz of difference. If you really care about the resonant frequency that much and want to pinpoint exactly some frequency, you can take the port out and uh, modify it, make it longer or shorter, depending on what tuning frequency you want to achieve. But let's look at other information. So if we look at these responses, they, they look pretty much the same. Not much difference I can extract from this information, except for the blue line. You can see that the standing wave is slightly to the right, so higher in frequency. This is arguably better because higher frequencies are easier to absorb and therefore less absorbent material is needed. This is the one with the port placed on the front at the bottom of the baffle and uh, on the port measurement, if we remember correctly, this one was with the highest sending wave output. So while it will be easier to absorb, it's louder than the others, so probably we are going to need more absorbent material anyway. So we win some, but we lose some. And if we check the distortion levels, I'm going to put it somewhere at 0-2%. Anything below 1% is good, but in this case the THD is pretty low. One thing to note when you are looking at these charts for near field measurements, speaker distortion will go up where the port will take over. So if you see this rising distortion, this is where the port takes over. And if we go to the port, we can see that this part has lower distortion and also it rises when the frequency is out of the playable range of the port. So if we look at the speaker near field and compare them, uh, I guess, yeah, this one has the lowest distortion. So the port on the side has the least amount of distortion. If I look at the port measurements, so this is the front, the front down low, 
this distortion looks very good but we know that uh, uh, the port placement there is the worst uh, when it comes to the standing wave so I'm not going to consider it uh, and this one and this one probably this one looks better yep this one has better distortion so let's draw a conclusion if I had these measurements before I made this project would I place the port on the side instead on the front yes would that make a noticeable difference? Most likely not. So to answer the question if moving the port will make a difference, the answer is yes. But in most cases it's so slight that this shouldn't be a concern when designing a box. Other factors should be more important. For example, if you make a subwoofer for your car and you plan to place it uh, in the trunk, resting against your rear bench, then it might be a great idea not to place the port on the rear panel you're going to choke the port. Maybe people who know how to use advanced software can tell where port placement is very important. I'm curious to know the niche cases where port placement is really important and does make a noticeable difference. So make sure to comment if you stumbled upon such cases. Also, subscribe to the channel if you like my videos and I'll see you next time. Peace!